But let's rewind and go one step bigger. You know, what's the point? What's the point of an excretory system? But perhaps let's begin first with what are some of the metabolic waste products you can think of? To put things into perspective, uh, then, we, then we zoom in after that on what our kidneys actually do. You can key in from the top of your head. If you like to research, you can research. And after that, other than what? Where? Where? Which part of our body excretes and get rid of these waste products? Then we'll have a look at some of your views. Uh, we can, you can skip the disruption part, leave it new. So 
with that in mind, we look at some of the points your friends brought up. Do we consider them metabolic waste or not? I have to say, some of the points brought up, I have not considered before whether they are metabolic waste or not. For example, so you brought up pus. Is pus a metabolic waste? I, I, at this point, I'm not very sure. Because when I think about pus, there are many, many steps to which pus is produced. Pus is a combination of many things. Uh, I think one may not consider pus a metabolic waste because actually when we look at pus microscopically, it consists of a lot of dead white blood cells. After the white blood cells fight and kill off bacteria and uh, viruses, they die, they become part of pus. So would that constitute metabolic waste? May not. Oh, but I'm not very sure because I've not seen this fall under the usual definition of metabolic waste. Uh, some classical examples of metabolic waste are things like urea, which I think many of your friends listed at the very beginning. Urea, ammonia. Then the question is, what metabolic process did they arise from? Actually, they arise from a process that you learned before in lower GH, deamination of proteins in the liver. You learned before in lower GH, excess proteins you eat, they will be deaminated, broken down. Ah, those are examples of waste. When we break down, break down excess proteins, those products are accumulated in your body actually can be quite toxic. Not something you want to keep in your body. This, this is one classic example of a metabolic waste. Another example of a metabolic waste, uh, some of you brought up, uh, CO2. What is the metabolic process that generated CO2? We learned this last year. Yeah, it is cellular respiration. Actually, our body has not much use of CO2. It is a byproduct, but not a meaningful byproduct that we can channel back in many purposes. Cellular respiration. What about poop? Removes these waste products. There's a 
get some brought up by your friends. Sweat glands is true. Our sweat glands is a medium, uh, uh, a channel through which we remove some of these metabolic waste products. Um, excess salts, they may not have participated in reactions, but we do get rid of some little bit of metabolic waste products through them. Respiratory system, while it is a system for us to breathe, get oxygen and, and get rid of carbon dioxide, but it also doubles as an excretory uh, organ, get rid of CO2. The kidneys, Jane also said the kidney, large intestines. So interestingly, the large intestine kind of absorbs whatever we need, whatever we don't need, it's kind of left behind. So not exactly we excretion per se, it is the leftovers of things that could participate in metabolic waste, uh, metabolic processes. Our skin, however, it is an organ that participates in get rid of excre uh, excretory waste products, metabolic waste products. Okay, what about small intestines? Okay, actually, in small intestines, in JH2, we learn its primary function is to absorb, not to eject things into our digestive system. But skin, lungs, kidneys, these are all organs responsible for getting rid of metabolic waste products. Urethra, nose, mouth, I would say they are not exactly the organs, but they are the channels through which these with metabolic waste products will come out of. Just like if I want to add one more, rather than the skin, they are sweat ducts, and the channels through which all of this will come out of. But I'd like to narrow things down. Although we describe this chapter as an excretory system, our focus will really be on the kidney. We want to focus on just this section. Your not the lungs, not your skin, but we focus on the kidneys. Why focus on the kidneys? Because we sort of have, have touched on the lungs, right? We already covered the lungs in the previous chapter. We've also learned a little bit about the skin in the previous chapters, right? Thermal regulation. And these two organs, you know that through the sweat, CO2 we breathe out. Actually, those are already excretory metabolic waste products. So actually, that's why we don't cover these two in depth. We sort of know already. We focus our attention on our kidneys. These two, this organ is extremely important. It helps to remove all of these excess water, lots of metabolic waste products that come from the emanation of proteins in your liver. It is so important that your kidneys fail, you often don't survive very long without your kidneys. You will also start to feel your body go out of breath. You will really feel the effects if your kidneys fail. When we hit that part of the chapter, when we learn more about what happens when your kidneys fail, I think you will you will start to take care of it a lot more. Actually, where are your kidneys? Do you know where they are? Okay. Here? Yeah. They are behind. Okay, so they are behind. They are somewhere over here, but you aim for the back. So they are actually located dorsally, more towards the back of your body than it is to the front. You punch someone like that, actually, what you're punching is not their kidneys. Uh, you are punching their air, abdomen muscles. Underneath that is the stomach. Because above the stomach is your diaphragm that, that sections the bottom from the top, right? So where your ribs are, your diaphragm is right below that portions out the ribs from the rest of the body. Then your stomach is below, below the diaphragm. That's where your oil intestines are. So that's why uh, if you all say that you have stomach pain, I uh, often as a biology teacher will ask one more question. Can you point to me where? Because if you point to me that your this part is hurting, I will tell you anatomically speaking, that's not where your stomach is. Then I will tell you likely your intestines are the ones that got problem. If someone says, uh, here is hurting and then they say they have heart pain. Then I'm like, actually this is where your stomach is. Your heart is somewhere up here. So if you want to describe your pain or sometimes when you say stomach pain, heart pain or that or you may not be anatomically that correct. You say point to the teacher where. That helps better. Doctors will also ask you to point. Correct or not? If you say you got pain, they'll ask you where. Is it here? Is it here? Because often we describe it properly. So where are your kidneys? They're actually at the back. Um, somewhere middle. Okay? Does it mean if you 
quite look at it, your ribs protect your lungs, right? So what protects your kidneys? Nothing much, huh? Okay, uh, it's just your back muscles. So don't go and give your friend a good kick at the back, you know, because if you give a good kick and back hard enough, you could hit the kidneys at the back. Okay, so don't go about doing that. Uh, okay, totally unrelated, I saw the news very sad. One, I think it's in Malaysia, a girl now paralyzed bottom right half, right, because someone pulled a chair from underneath. Then she fell on her toe bone. Um, our body really is very intricately balanced. Right? Everything is a connected body. Damage one part can really affect someone's life. All for a simple prank. You pull out the chair, the girl fell on her toe bone. From then on, because the toe bone is where all these motor and sensory neurons will come out from, they will link to the legs. Yeah, so now that part is gone. Uh, also, cannot control a bladder anymore. Yeah, so, a lot of nervous system. So, we're going to focus on the kidneys. And we actually started off looking at the real sample, right? The aim of today's lesson, we're going to give a deep dive into the structure of the kidney. Okay. After that, we will go a little bit microscopic, and we'll look at the structure that is really involved in helping to create urine. We call those structures nephrons. And that's our focus for today. Can you erase? Can? Okay. First and foremost, to appreciate how our kidneys work, we got to appreciate this structure. As with every chapter, we start off first with understanding the parts, then we know how they work together. Right? Every system works like that. Then we end up with how we can disrupt it. Um, these are the success criteria. As long as you're able to do these things, uh, you know that you are you understand it. Uh, you notice that the success criteria kind of link together. They build on each other. So for example, you look at the first one. Huh? If you can identify all these various parts, good. Can identify the blood vessels? Good. Can identify parts of the nephron? Great. If you are able to identify all the parts, you can do the final last two, which is to trace the pathways. Um, you'll find that the questions we craft fall within this kind of uh, scope. Uh, these are the things we hope that you can achieve at the end of the lesson. Okay, so today's focus is really to look at the big structures and the microscopic structures of our kidney. Let's do a quick recap of what we learned recently. Okay, we dissected the kidney part and it kind of looked like a bean shape. Uh, you do a quick recap yourself. Okay, if, let's say without looking at the textbook, just exercise your brain. Okay, out of sheer recall. Uh. Okay, so there are various parts. Uh. You just use your sheer recall. You can uh, recap with your friends. Just try not to refer to the textbook. What is the outer layer called? Right, then after that, there were many pyramid, there were many triangular-like structures. And all these triangular kind of structures were located in this zone, what do you call this zone? And then there's an outer zone, right? And then there was the inner zone, right? Inner layer. But what do we refer to each one of these as? Okay. Other than that, we also had a lot of structures coming in and out of the kidney. We learned that there will be one big tube that will come out. This tube is where eventually your urine will flow out from. We also learned that there were blood vessels coming in. They are drawing in purple. So here are some blood vessels. One blood vessel coming in. And by right, we should have another blood vessel coming out. Right? Because we need to clean the blood. The D blood coming in, D blood going out. Okay? So what are all these Ring? Ring? What is this outer layer called? Capsule. Ring. Okay, so as you can see, it is the capsule. But I think as you were dissecting yesterday, it's not exactly as tough as the sclera, right? Uh, I think perhaps it's because your eyeballs are actually quite exposed. Yeah? Someone can actually touch your eyeball if they wanted to, but they cannot touch your feet. Still protected by a lot of fat, uh, 
of muscle surrounding it. Okay, next, there is the outer layer, which you found to be rather bright red. Yeah, that layer is called the uh, Isabel? Cortex. Yeah, it's called the cortex. You find that uh, in biology, a lot of the outer layer of things they often refer to as the cortex. So don't be surprised to see this word appear again. Next time, if you want to take biology, I highlight the book. Brain also called cortex. Okay, next, what do we refer to each one of these? Okay, I'll be deleting it to if I ask you the question because I already said it earlier on. This one of them are called pyramid. Yeah. Okay, then last but not least. This layer, where the pyramids reside, we refer to them as the uh, Keller. Thank you, Medulla. Broadly speaking, these are the big structures you can observe. Everything else are, are microscopic, and that's why we would have to rely on diagrams more so than real specimens. What you experience yesterday, however, you know, under the microscope, so you've got to look at parts of the microscopic structures. First of all, let's look at the blood vessels, the three major tubes going in and out. These major tubes are key to understanding how the kidney works. Okay? Number one, uh, let's work backwards. Here, I have a big tube. This big tube coming out, I refer to as a ureter. Okay? I need you to follow with me now, because now, from big, I'm going to start to go microscopic. I'm going to go backwards. Reverse type uh, of our urine production. So let's go backwards. Let's just look at a singular pyramid here. Okay? If I go upstream a little bit, yesterday you all got to experience, right? There were like smaller cubes. Each one linking to the major ureter, right? There was a pocket here that we referred to as the renal pelvis. But then there were slightly bigger tubes arching into each pyramid. Yeah? Okay, let's, let's go upstream even more. In truth, uh, all of these all of these bigger tubes branch out to smaller and smaller and smaller tubes. Okay? I'm gonna this is not proportionate. But I need to draw it so they can visualize. This big tube will branch into smaller one, like streams of a river. Okay. And if I go a little bit upstream some more, these tubes will exit the medulla. They will start to get very convoluted here. Okay, I. I now oh, it doesn't make sense, but later on, as we learn a little bit more, it makes a little bit more sense. When these tubes are out of the medulla, they get very, very convoluted. No longer as parallel in nature and straight. Very, very convoluted. Okay. So that, that is the interface, that is the pathway your, your, your urine will eventually take. You'll, you'll flow down these blue tubes, microscopic tubes into these bigger channels, into the renal pelvis, out of your ureter. Okay. Where does this go? Okay, this goes to an organ you are aware of. This goes to your bladder, which is this bag over here. Yeah. And where does the bladder go? Okay, I don't know if you all this all this channel before. Uh. Urethra. Okay, the urethra. Urethra. Okay, urethra. This is the whole two page urine you will actually come from. We expect you to know this pathway. Yeah. So, for example, we may provide you in scrambled sequence urethra, bladder, ureter, you know, pelvis, these tubes, which we will learn the names of. And then we ask you, what is the pathway filtered, uh, the filtrate? which is the filtered blood, will take out of the body. Then we expect you to know the sequence. Where's the liver, is it? Or how? Okay, why do you ask this question? Oh, okay. So how does the liver 
will relate to all this because it is at the level where the urea is produced, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I would say, okay, where is your liver? Your liver is somewhere in this region over here also. Very big organ. So, but your liver is not anatomically connected to your kidneys. So how do we get the urea from the liver to your kidneys? You'll come by here. Okay. You'll come by this blood vessel coming in. In fact, this blood vessel carries a lot of waste from all parts of your body to go into our ultimate filter. Okay, so I've been referring to this as tubes. Actually, these tubes are called nephron. Okay, and that is what we are going to focus a lot on. Nephron. Nephrons are really these microscopic tubes through which our urine will begin to form. Yes? Then what are the minor calyxes? Okay, so all those minor major calyxes, I don't need you to really commit to memory or know them in depth. Um, just think of them as as more and more nephrons join to each other, you will get major calyx, minor calyx. So calyx is just to me, uh, just a uh, combination of many nephrons joining at the ends. Yeah. Notice everything will start to connect into bigger tubes and bigger tubes and bigger tubes. We will spend a lot of time on the nephrons. The kidneys are merely just a housing unit to store as many nephrons as we can. So in every pyramid, you find lots and lots and lots of nephrons. They kind of run parallel to each other inside the medulla, but once out of it, they get very, very convoluted. Okay. How many of these microscopic nephrons do we have? Millions, millions of them. So many that even a giant dialysis machine cannot replicate them. It just cannot. This is such an intricate system that even so we cannot replicate a machine that can be so intricate. The best part of it all is that around the size of your face, each kidney. And the dialysis, dialysis machine is trying to replicate what the kidney does, except that it is almost the height of my knee and the weight of me. But it's way thicker than me. Yeah. And it cannot even filter blood as efficiently as your tiny little So take very good care of it. For us, we will spend a lot of our time learning about how the kidneys can filter blood. For the kidneys to filter blood, it means to say, somehow, the kidney must be able to filter the blood coming in through this big tube. Somehow, right? So that the blood going out is clean. So that is our focus. A lot of time in this chapter we're going to spend trying to understand how the blood coming in here can be cleaned by these structures. Let me label these structures now. This is an artery. This is a vein. Anything related to the kidney, we include this in front. Renal. Renal. This is a renal artery. This is a renal vein. Vein leaves the kidney, artery enters the kidney. I've spoken a lot, but let's put things into perspective and see how everything connects with each other uh, with 3D visuals.
seen. The process of digestion and absorption releases nutrients into the bloodstream. But excess nutrients, salts, minerals, and water, as well as drugs and toxins, can also enter the bloodstream through the digestive system. Further, the cells of the body release toxic waste products such as ammonia, which is converted to less toxic urea by the liver, into the bloodstream. These excess materials and drugs, toxins, and wastes, if allowed to build up in the bloodstream, can threaten an individual by throwing off critical chemical balances. The blood and extracellular fluid that bathe in body cells must have a close to neutral pH. Precisely regulated concentrations of various salts, appropriate levels of water in dissolved substances, and of course, cellular waste products must not be allowed to reach toxic levels. The burden of maintaining proper chemical balance for homeostasis in the body falls largely on the kidneys. Human kidneys are paired, kidney bean-shaped organs located on either side of the spinal column and extending slightly above the waist. Each is approximately 13 centimeters long, 8 centimeters wide, and 2.5 centimeters thick. Blood carrying various waste enters each kidney through a renal artery. After it has been filtered, the blood exits through the renal vein. Urine, which is a mixture of water, dissolved wastes and toxins, and some excess nutrients filtered out of the blood, leaves each kidney through a narrow muscular tube called the ureter. Peristaltic contractions drive urine through the ureter to the bladder, a hollow muscular chamber that collects and stores urine. The walls of the bladder contain smooth muscle capable of considerable expansion. Urine is retained in the bladder by two sphincter muscles located at its base, just above the juncture with the urethra. When the bladder becomes distended, receptors in the walls trigger reflexive contractions. The sphincter nearest the bladder, the internal sphincter, is open during these contractions. However, the lower or external sphincter is under voluntary control, so the reflex can be suppressed by the brain unless bladder distension becomes acute. The average adult bladder will hold about 500 milliliters or approximately a pint of urine, but the urge to urinate is triggered by considerably smaller accumulations. Urine completes its journey to the outside through a single narrow tube called the urethra. The kidney contains a solid outer layer where urine is formed and a hollow inner chamber called the renal pelvis, which is a branched collecting chamber that funnels urine into the urethra. The outer layer of the kidney is divided into a fan-shaped inner renal medulla and an overlying renal cortex. Microscopic examination of these structures reveals an array of tiny individual filters or nephrons. Over one million nephrons are packed into the cortex of each kidney, with many extending into the renal medulla. Blood is conducted to each nephron by an arterial that branches from the renal artery. Within a cup-shaped portion of the nephron, the Bowman's capsule, the arterial branches into a network of approximately 50 microscopic capillaries that form an intertwined mass, the glomerulus. The arterial leading the glomerulus is smaller in diameter than the one coming in, creating pressure within the structure that forces water and many dissolved substances such as urea, glucose, salts, amino acids, and certain vitamins through its extremely permeable capillary walls in a process called filtration. The resulting fluid, called filtrate, is collected in the Bowman's capsule for transport through the tubule.
disease called uh, urinary tract infection. Uh, it is a disease that affects the urethra. The urethra that tube where urine goes up from, bacteria can grow. And often when it grows, it can go upwards into the bladder. The whole bladder could then be infected. If the infection progresses too fast, it can go up the ureters, tap into the kidneys, and people can actually get their kidneys damaged through the urinary tract infection. So what does this mean? It means to say that you, other than taking care of your kidneys, you also want to have a healthy amount of water you drink. Don't drink enough water, you end up retaining urine longer than you should, or if you don't drink enough water, you don't pee things out constantly and wash the bacteria away from the urethra that is collecting there, you can also develop a lot of bacterial flow. So, drink lots of water. Everyone has their water break now. Drink, really you must drink to clean up your system. Don't drink, bacteria will grow in your system. Anatomic 
anyway, look at the structure first before we dive deeper into it. Over here. Okay, last part of the lesson, we're going to try and make sense how the renal artery eventually interacts with the nephron. Interacts in a rather interesting way. Once you look at this structure, we go on to the next page. Have a look at the structure on the next page. It goes more in depth. Don't worry, you eventually get quite proficient at this structure. Yeah, as I was saying, last part of our lesson, last 10 minutes. We're going to see how the blood vessel carrying the blood that is filled with metabolic waste, how does this blood vessel interact with the nephrons so that we can do the filtering? Okay, let's look at this diagram. On a microscopic level, this is how it goes. The renal artery will eventually branch out into many arterioles. And that's why I say we cannot detach this chapter from the chapter of the cardiovascular system. I'm going to use a lot of words like arterioles, capillary, minimals, veins. Okay? The renal artery will branch into many, many tiny arteries called arterioles. And I'm just going to draw one arterial here. These arterioles will eventually branch out into capillaries. So now I'm going to draw tinier vessels. Branch out into capillaries. These capillaries will wrap around the nephrons. Eventually, the capillaries will branch back into venules, and the venules will join back into the veins. We need to try to understand how the blood capillaries that branch out from the arterioles interact with the nephrons. Uh, and, and this is really the diagram that you will see very, very often from now onwards. We represent the nephrons with these yellow tubes. We like to use the color yellow to represent nephrons because that's where the, the initial urine is being formed. We like to represent blood vessels with red and blue. As usual, the colors red represent that it's oxygenated. But it's not quite relevant to this chapter. What's more relevant is that the red cubes are the ones that carry all the metabolic waste products in. We see that the blood vessels wrap around the nephron at many points, right? It's wrapping outside. I would like you to zoom in to just this part of it, this box part. Notice that this box part the, the blood capillaries aren't quite wrapping around the nephrons. In fact, it is enveloped by the nephron. Right? Now that's what the diagram is trying to show. The nephron kind of wraps around the capillaries. This is the most important part. This part is where the filtration takes place. It is at this region here, at this bundle of capillaries, that the blood gets filtered. Uh, next week, we will dive more into the structure in depth. But right now, just overall. Overall. Okay, so now let's describe some names for these capillaries. Uh, I keep saying capillary, but actually they have specific names. This bundle of capillary you see over here, we refer to it as the glomerulus. Actually, you saw it under the microscope that day. That day, when you're looking under the microscope, remember, you were seeing these kind of structures. Then after that, you saw a bundled mass inside. Actually, you were looking at the glomerulus. You were looking at this structure from, a, from various perspectives. Okay, so that was the glomerulus you were looking at. The glomerulus will eventually join back to form another arterial. Okay, so you see that there are two arterioles up. There's an apron arterial. The one that starts with the A, apron arterial. The apron arterial branches out into this mass of capillaries, which we call the glomerulus. It will then reform back to form something called efferent arterial. 
and this arterial will then branch out again to many capillaries that will wrap around the nephron. Eventually, all these capillaries will join back to link back to the renal vein. This is the flow of blood. Your job as a student is to be able to trace the flow of blood. So when you look at this diagram, can you see how blood flows? Can you? To, uh, I, to someone who sees this for the first time, they actually don't know how blood flows. But if you trace the pathway, it makes a little bit more sense. How does blood flow? If I were to lead you to. Okay, for those that cannot see how the blood flows, let me lead you to what? Number one. It flows via the renal vein, sorry, renal artery, comes in via the apron arterial, branches into these capillaries called the glomerulus, they rejoin to form the apron arterial, they branch out again to form lots of capillaries that we call the peritubular capillaries. They then go downwards. These capillaries we call the vasa recta. Then they go upwards again and rejoin, eventually joining to the renal vein. So this is the pathway that blood takes. If you like to in your notes, you can trace the arrows, make it a little bit clearer for yourself to show the flow of blood. You are expected to know this flow. Not memorize. Likely we show you all the parts scrambled. You can see the sequence then for but on my part, over the years as I'm teaching, I found mind maps may help. If you scroll down, this is a mind map that I used to create for myself to learn the sequence through which blood should flow and the sequence through which your filtrate or your urine should flow. For yourself, if you are able to match the sequence correctly, that's good enough. Okay, that's really good enough. So all the parts that we're dealing with, where do they fit in? I haven't taught you all the names of the parts of the nephron. May I get you to look at your textbook? Or the image above? Zoom in, look at all the parts of the nephron. Okay, we have numbered the parts, proximal tubule, distal tubule, loop of penne, collecting ducts, so on and so forth. Can you see the sequence of flow? Okay, I'd like you to try. Look at both your notes as well as all the diagrams. Compare. Make sense of the flow of blood and the flow that urine will take. And then try to drag and drop. Once you're done with that, if you think you understand the sequence, and if you got it largely all correct, you could screenshot that mind map, paste it into your notes. I think it's quite a good uh, organizer to help you understand the sequence that blood and urine needs to take. That's all, that's your little homework. Uh, make sense of the structures, the flow of blood and filtrate or urine. Next lesson, we will run through this flow together. your time to watch this video. If you're reading, it's not your stuff or learning. Um, you could watch this animation. It takes you through the various parts of the nephron in sequence or so.